प्राइम यंग प्राइम यंग यूनिवर्सिटी यूटा यूएसए इज पब्लिश मोर देन 160 scientific articles in various journals like mis quarterly information system research journal of association of information systems computers in human behavior and so many uh, his research focuses in augmented reality human computer interaction and human cognition dr gaskin is best known for his efforts to make advanced statistical methods like structure equation modeling accessible to the world His statistic YouTube YouTube channel and accompanying state wiki are viewed thousand of times each day and nearly twenty million views to date. Dr. Gaskin is also a serial entrepreneur, having helped start eight companies in the last year. Welcome, Professor James Gaskin, to IIT Delhi. Floor hello. is all yours. Thanks. Um, hello, everybody. I uh, I'm I'm excited or happy to do this. I occasionally do these workshops for uh, universities or groups or conferences, and I'm sorry it's going to be a short workshop. It's just an hour and a half, and uh, usually I hold big like three day seminars, workshops, trying to cover three uh, semesters of statistics all in three days, which is pretty intense. Um, but uh, the pandemic has prevented me from doing much of that lately. Uh, just so you know, this meeting is being recorded, and none of your faces are on it except uh, Sachin. Uh, your face is there, so people will see that probably. I uh, hope you're okay with that when I post it to YouTube. Um, but for the most part, you guys won't be seen, so don't worry. Uh, as I post to YouTube, I'm gonna send along the chat. Let's see, here's the chat window. Um, I'm gonna send oops, a, a few links real quick to a data set that I'm going to use today. Let me see, here are the links over here. There we go, just posted. Uh, the first is a link to the SPSS file. It's actually a file I used for another workshop I just did for uh, one of the conferences. Uh, so forgive the name, it's tailored to that conference, but we're going to cover the same stuff. So uh, that should work just fine. Uh, the another link is to the stat wiki. Some of you might be familiar with some of my resources uh, that I've put online. One of them is a wiki called stat wiki and it has a lot of information about statistics and SEM in particular um, and everything there is free. And then there's an online SEM course if uh, you want to brush up on your statistics or if you want to earn college credit uh, for learning SEM. Uh, this is essentially an interactive book, textbook, but with videos and assignments and quizzes and grades if you want grades um, and a completion certificate when you're done if you want that. Um, that one's not free, uh, but uh, it's, I've made it far less expensive than any workshop fee um, for a, a real workshop. So hopefully that's accommodating to most people. Today, today I'm going to use this uh, SPSS file that's linked at the top. And we're going to go through exploratory factor analysis and then confirmatory factor analysis in AMOS, uh, EFA, exploratory factor analysis in SPSS. Um, but then in AMOS, do CFA and not everything with CFA. There's quite a bit you can do with CFA. I'm just going to sort of brush the, the surface. Um, and then we'll get into some causal modeling, like uh, path models, latent causal models. Um, mediation. Hopefully we'll have time for some mediation, maybe some moderation. And we'll see how far we get. I, I do have to leave promptly at 10 p.m. your time uh, in India. I have another meeting I have to drive off to uh, that I could not reschedule. So we have an hour and a half. One more thing. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to be assuming that most people are not following along in the data set. Um, I, I make this assumption because I'm going to be going faster than usual. Um, it's all being recorded, and I have videos for everything I'm going to do today. There are videos already online, um, and I, there just won't be time to follow along slowly. If you're fairly adept and savvy with uh, statistics software, with SPSS in particular, please do feel free to follow along. Um, but I won't be answering like troubleshooting questions and, and trying to keep everybody up to speed with me as we go through this. Um, I, I just give you the data set so that if you want to uh, later go back and watch this video and do the analyses, you have the data set. 
um, but I will not be trying to keep everybody step by step with me because I'll be going way too fast. Also, uh, Sachin, should I turn on closed captioning? Would that be helpful? You're muted, but I saw a nod. Okay. Um, live transcription enable auto. Oops, I just hit disable. Uh -huh. Just a sec. It's enabling. There we go. Okay, hopefully this helps. And it's going to be kind of confusing probably with statistics. I mean, that's like another language. Um, so it's like translating two languages at a time. Looks like it's doing okay. Good. All right, here we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, I will share this screen. Share. And hopefully you can now see um, the SPSS window. And as we go along, I, I should say, as we go along, feel free to uh, chime in, ask questions. This doesn't need to just be like a fire hose of information. Uh, if you want to ask questions, feel free. Um, maybe don't like constantly ask questions if you're the only one asking questions, but feel free to ask questions. You can post them also in the chat window, which I better open up so that I have some awareness of what's going on in chat. Let's see, where did my chat window go? There it is. Um, I'll be monitoring that. Um, and if I see a question there, I'll try to answer it uh, in real time. OK, for those who have no background in this stuff, which I assume is a couple of you at least, um, this is SPSS. SPSS is a statistics software primarily for first generation statistics, things like t-tests, ANOVAs, uh, correlations, regressions, things like that. And um, it allows you to do some more sophisticated stuff as well, which I'll be showing you today, uh, like exploratory factor analysis. So this data set is the data set I sent out a link for on the chat window. If you still need that, just ask and we'll post it again. Um, and I'm going to go through how to use SPSS very briefly, uh, but also how to conduct an exploratory factor analysis, maybe in a little more detail. So first off, this is one view of SPSS. There are actually two views. This is the data view down at the bottom. You see there's a variable view as, as well with all of our variables on the left and information about them, including uh, the survey wording in that label column. Now, uh, for those who are not super familiar with um, behavioral research, often we conduct behavioral research quantitatively through surveys. And in surveys, we often ask questions, uh, multiple questions about the same construct, like anxiety or computer use or playfulness. And all of these things ask about the same construct. And using all of those measures together, we can sort of surround this idea of a construct and measure it, hopefully effectively, hopefully validly. And we can use SPSS, among other tools, uh, to validate those measures, to see if we did validly and reliably measure the construct we thought we measured or we intended to measure. So one way to do that is through exploratory factor analysis. I should say, before you even do exploratory factor analysis, there's actually a lot of other stuff you need to do, like cleaning your data, uh, restructuring and organizing your data, taking care of missing values, uh, looking at skewness and kurtosis, all the normality assumptions, uh, looking at outliers. So there's, there's actually a lot you do before exploratory factor analysis, but we don't have time for all that. Um, it is in the stat wiki. It is in the online SEM course, if you're interested. Uh, I have other resources and videos online that cover all this. But we're going to jump straight to the EFA. And for those who are familiar with the uh, measurement model arguments in the literature, you'll know that an EFA is sometimes uh, debated. Do we need an EFA? An EFA is an exploratory, unguided factor analysis. It's where we say, here, SPSS, here are all of our measures. How do they group? sort of like a cluster analysis, but for variables. Um, and scholars say, well, we don't need that because we never design a survey without a measurement theory in mind. Uh, we know which measures measure which constructs. And so why do you need to explore that? Um, and they're right. Uh, you don't need to do an EFA if you have 
a measurement theory in mind. If you do have someone else's data, secondary data, you did not design the data set, uh, you have data from some large association or organization, some nonprofit, they often don't have a theory going into their measures. And so an EFA is very helpful. So that's why I'm going to show it to you. Here we go. I'm actually going to do some stuff now. To do an EFA, you would go to Analyze and Dimension Reduction and Factor. Again, I'm going to go fast because not enough time uh, to keep everybody up with me. What we're going to do is we're only going to bring in the latent measures, the measures for latent constructs. Um, for that, that's like anxiety one down through useful seven. Um, notice I skipped the ID. You don't want to start factoring an ID, a variable. Um, I also skipped these other values down here. Uh, is my screen big enough for everybody to see or do I need to zoom in? Well, it's good it's to so here, here's here's what it looks like zoomed in. Maybe I'll, I'll do this here and there. Maybe that'll help. Okay, so here are all the these latent uh, measures for latent factors. You can see that there are many for each construct. Um, for example, these S O C D E S one through ten. Those are all for social desirability. Um, but down here at the bottom, we have things like age, experience, gender. These are not measures. Uh, that belong to sets of measures for a latent construct. These are individual observed measures. We have an actual value for age and for gender and, and for things like that. And so they don't belong to some latent construct. They are individual measures. They do not belong in a factor analysis. So I'm going to exclude them. I'm going to put all these measures for latent constructs over here in the variables area. And then let me zoom out here. I'm going to just go through each of these buttons real quick. And let's see if it shows up. Oh, it's up on my other screen. Sorry, here we go. Um, on this screen, the descriptive screen, there are some options. And I'm not going to explain each of these, but I do explain them in uh, my course and on the wiki and in some videos. Uh, these just determine what output you see in SPSS. I would like to see the reproduced matrix. I'd like to see the KMO and Bartlett's test. Uh, these help me know whether this is a well, reproduce matrix helps me know if I have a good factoring solution. Uh, the KMO and Bartlett's test lets me know if I have a good set of measures that are appropriate for a factor analysis. Again, there's lots of other stuff. I'm not going to worry about it right now, but you're welcome to explore it and play with it. Uh, that's how you that's how you can learn. In the extraction button, which is hiding on my other screen, just a sec. There we go. Um, this is probably the most important button here. It allows us to choose which method of um, factoring we'd like, to, uh, we'd like to use. So the most common methods are principal components analysis, PCA, uh, maybe maximum likelihood, and principal axis factoring, PAF. There are other options. Um, in fact, the default option in some other software is GLS, uh, general least squares. Um, but I'm just going to keep it at principal components. You're welcome to choose what you want. There are reasons behind choosing each one of those. If you'd like to know more about that, um, I talk about that on the stat wiki. Also, Joseph Hare in his book, Multivariate Data Analysis, talks about each of these methods and why you might choose one over the other. Uh, but then later in his book, he says, but really, you end up with more or less the same solution. So it's since it's exploratory, just pick one and pick another and pick another and, and learn something. And uh, that's the whole point of exploring your data. It, there's no like definitive right answer here. It's just exploration. So I'm going to leave it at principal components. I'm also going to extract factors based on eigenvalues. Uh, an eigenvalue is a value of contribution to explained variance. And uh, there's a lot behind that. But, but uh, essentially, anything that has an eigenvalue of one or more is considered a good contributor to explained variance. So I'll use that as my cutoff criteria uh, for extracting a factor. And continue. Let's zoom out. Uh, rotation lets you pick the rotation type. There are actually different types of rotation on a factor analysis. 
Uh, a factor analysis, it can iterate and actually ro rotate the view on the data to uh, minimize error and spread out the, the factors and condense the factors so there's more discriminant validity and more convergent validity uh, within and between factors. So I do like to rotate my factor analysis. I use Promax, but there are other options. Um, Veramax is a very popular approach. Uh, Direct Oberman is a default in M+, I think. Um, there are different reasons to use each. I'm just going to use Promax for now, and you're just going to have to trust me on that one. I'm not going to use scores, uh, but let me show you what's in here. Scores allows you to save each factor as a variable. So in SEM, we have these uh, sort of massive models with uh, factors that are measured by multiple measures. And it's kind of messy, a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of parameters. And so one thing you can do to simplify your massive SEM models um, is use factor scores instead of these latent factors. It's like if you were to take the average or sum or use just one proxy variable to represent your factor. Same idea here, but this is a weighted average that is also standardized. So um, it is considered the most valid approach uh, to, to representing a latent factor. I'm not gonna do this right now, but if you were going to do it, you would check the box for save as variables. And then it would save a variable in your data set at the bottom to represent each of the factors that was extracted. Last year's options, bring that down here. In options, uh, this is just preference sort of stuff. Uh, we can sort the factor analysis to be prettier. We can suppress small coefficients so that it's not as messy. I'm actually gonna do this one, uh, suppressing small coefficients. I'm gonna suppress it down to 0.3. Um, I don't care about any loadings less than 0.3. I don't show those to me in my pattern matrix, uh, the, the solution. Okay, that's it. I know that was a lot of information, but it is being recorded. You have it all in front of you um, and you'll have access to this on YouTube when we're done. And so this is really just to make you aware of the options and what's possible and, and some little explanation of why I'm doing each thing, but not a full explanation. What we have here is the output. The KMO and Bartlett's again is an explanation of, or a measure of whether the set of variables we have chosen is adequately correlated, uh, meaning that, that it's appropriate to do a factor analysis. A factor analysis uh, has the basic assumption that the items are correlated. In fact, that's how it determines which items belong with, with other items to group them into factors. And if your items aren't correlated, uh, your KMO will be low, and it's a sign that these aren't correlated strongly enough to do a factor analysis. Same idea with communalities, the extent to which each item is correlated with other items. Uh, you want, I should say, I should uh, say uh, actually for the camo, you want something above 0.9 ideally, but above 0.7 is fine. Uh, for communalities in the extraction column, you're looking for values above 0.3. There are different thresholds published here. Um, I use 0.3. But if you find something less than 0.3, you don't automatically kick it out. It's just one bit of evidence that might contribute to a mountain of evidence uh, for removing an item. But you would never remove an item just because its uh, communality was low. Okay, let me scroll down. This table, the total variance explained table, um, this shows you how many factors were extracted. And you can tell by this, um, this last filled row. So we have nine factors or components, since it's a PCA, we have nine components extracted, meaning we had nine components or factors uh, with an eigenvalue greater than one. You see the eigenvalues, oops, sorry, uh, right after the ninth one drop below one. So we don't extract that factor. The variance explained here is sort of like an R squared, like you're familiar with, with uh, regressions. It's how much variance is explained by a nine factor solution. And obviously more is better. And we explained 66% of the variance. Is that good? Yeah, uh, anything over 60 is good. And anything over 50 is more explanation 
by the factors than by error um, or by uh, chance. So uh, above 50 is fine, above 60 is better. Zooming out. Component matrix, I'm going to skip. Reproduce correlations. As I mentioned before, this is a signal uh, as to whether your solution is a good solution. It says here's the amount of non redundant residuals with absolute values greater than 0.05. What this means is how much uh, error is there? And we want less error. So approach zero, uh, less than 50% for sure, less, less than 5%, good. Um, we're at 10%, so we're pretty good. Not phenomenal, but pretty good. And here, the pattern matrix, this is uh, where you're going to spend most of your time in an EFA. You're going to look at the loadings, that's these values here, and the factors they load on. Or in this case, since it's a principal components analysis, it's the component they load on. So anxiety loads all together, all of the measures for anxiety. They are highly correlated with each other, but not correlated, well, not highly correlated with all of the other items. And how do we know that? Well, because here on component three, all of the anxiety items load together with loadings greater than 0.7 in this case, uh, but they're strong loadings. Anything above 0.7 is considered strong. Anything above 0.5 is considered fine. Uh, you can have loadings down to 0.35, uh, depending on the circumstance. But uh, you want them to load together more strongly on uh, their home or primary component or factor uh, and not load elsewhere very strongly. Now, in this matrix, I have suppressed or hidden any loadings less than 0.3. So even though, for example, anxiety one does load everywhere, its loadings are less than 0.3, except for on component three. I should just show this. Um, I'm just going to rerun this real quick without suppressing, whoops, not that one, without suppressing those small coefficients, just so you can see what I mean here. If I go down to the pattern matrix again, you can see this is the same pattern matrix as this one. All I'm doing is I'm suppressing those low loadings. So every item loads on every component or every factor, um, but I'm just hiding the low loadings because it makes it easier to read. And we don't really care that much about the really low loadings. So here we are again. Comp use, uh, another construct loads nicely together and not anywhere else. Same with playful. Now you'll notice here we have a loading less than 0.7. Is that bad? Should I delete that item? No, uh, that is not bad. Don't delete items that have loadings less than 0.7. Uh, again, down to 0.5 is fine. Um, even down lower is fine, depending on certain criteria. Uh, having a low loading is not um, sufficient evidence to just delete an item. There should be lots of evidence against that item uh, before you delete it. So that's fine. I'm not worried about that at all. We get down to social desirability, and something weird has happened. We have three different components in social desirability. Hmm. So it didn't load together, although it did load in dimensions. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. Let's make sure the other things are fine. Information, oops, information acquisition looks good. And decision quality, we have, ooh, here's a lower loading. Decision quality 11 at 481. Is that bad? Again, it's fine. It's, it's not great, um, but it's probably not uh, justification to delete that item. Uh, as we look later, if the Cronbach's alpha is uh, suffering because of it, or if convergent validity measures such as the AVE um, can't meet uh, certain targets, then maybe we'll consider dropping that item, maybe. Here in usefulness looks pretty good. So let's go back to social desirability where we had the problem. Social desirability should load as a single factor. It's not. There are things we can do about this. We can uh, crunch, uh, we can force it to load as a single factor, uh, or we can explore the wording of those dimensions and, and see if there are truly multiple dimensions to this factor. Let's do the 
lazy and easy thing first, we're going to just redo this factor analysis. Let me go suppress again. Um, and instead of extracting however many we extracted, that looks like we extracted nine, uh, let's extract to seven, because that's how many we actually expect. So in the extraction options, instead of extracting based on eigenvalues, I'm going to extract a fixed number of factors, and that's going to be seven. So it's going to force it, regardless of eigenvalues, it's going to force it to extract just seven. Hit OK. It says still a good solution, still a good solution. Uh, still explaining 61% of the variance, almost 62% of the variance, so still a good solution. Scroll down here, error 16%, not great, but not terrible. Here's the pattern matrix, it looks a bit of a mess. Nope, wait up, is this the one? Yep, here's the pattern matrix. Looks a bit of a mess. Um, looks like I didn't suppress at 0.3, I suppressed at 0.1, oh well. Um, let me just fix that real quick to make it easier to read. One thing I love about SPSS is you can run things pretty fast. Uh, so if you make mistakes or if you wanna try new things, doesn't take long to redo it. Here we go. We forced social desirability to collapse and it wouldn't, look at this, it, it will not collapse into a single factor. Um, instead, it collapsed these two into a single factor, which, which tells me that information acquisition and decision quality are more highly correlated than the dimensions of social desirability because these two won't collapse into each other. Um, so truly we have multiple dimensions here. Now, what do you do with that? Um, the next thing is do the, the not lazy thing. Let me go back, rerun the factor analysis with regular extraction based on eigenvalues, just so that's my latest. But the, the thing you do is the not lazy thing, and you go read the wording of these survey questions and figure out, is there a uh, conceptual theme to each set. So in this case, one through three are those strongly related to each other, but not conceptually related to numbers four and five. I'm just going to do this once, and then we're going to move on. So here's social desirability, one, two, and three. Let me zoom in here. And the wording, I'm always willing to admit when I make a mistake. I always try to practice what I preach. I never resent being asked to return a favor. These are all in the same theme, for sure. And then four and five, I've never been irked when some when people express ideas very different from my own. Well, first off, it's hard to read and people might not have understood that wording. I've never deliberately said something that hurts someone's feelings. Um, kind of a double negative there. And then those are separated from these. I like to gossip at times. So now we're in an opposite direction. So the first few were like, no, I'm a good person. These last ones are, no, I'm a bad person. Uh, I like to gossip. I try to get even. Um, I insist on having things my way. I like to smash things. Um, these are fun items, but uh, they don't belong with the first three. And so it makes sense that they're factoring separately. So what do I do? I'm going to keep them separate. Okay. That is a factor analysis. Uh, we want to talk about a few things with factor analyses. Uh, the first is adequacy. Are these measures adequately correlated? Uh, yes, they are. We saw that in the KMO uh, measures. Um, do they have convergent validity? Uh, that we can observe by looking at the loadings. Are they strongly loading? Yes, they are. Do they have discriminant validity? That is, are they loading only on their own factor and not on some other factor very strongly? And for the most part, they are. The one we observed that didn't have good discriminant validity was social desirability. Actually, it didn't have good convergent validity either because it didn't all load together. Um, but do the individual dimensions of social desirability um, manifest good convergent and discriminant validity? Well, let's look at it. Social desirability one through three, those loadings are fairly good, all about 0.5, so convergent. Over here, what about this one? Social desirability three loads in both places. Well, remember, it actually loads in all places. Um, this is just a secondary loading that is greater than 0.3. Is that a problem? Eh, not really. It, it's still quite a bit different from its primary loading. Um, the threshold I like to use is, is it 0.2 different? Um, and it is, it's at least 0.2 different. 
Um, some other publications say even 0.1 different is fine. So there's that. So I would only count these two as the items loading on this factor. And they do load nice and high. And then this factor, not as strong. And I would say that's kind of expected because the items are quite divisive. Um, you looked at those measures, so talking about gossip and getting even and smashing things. People are going to answer those very, very differently. And so it's not a surprise to me that they don't have a really good convergent validity. The last thing with the factor analysis um, is the reliability of the set of measures per construct. And the way you test that in an EFA is with a Cronbox alpha. In a CFA would be with a composite reliability. Um, let's just show you real quick a Cronbox alpha in analyze scale reliability analysis. We have the ability to test Cronbox alpha I'm just going to stick all of the items from a single set of measures in here. Hit OK. And down here, this very tiny table here says we have a 0.934 Cronbox alpha. Is that good? Yes, it's very good. Uh, we want above a 0.7, ideally. Uh, there are actually reasons you might accept as low as 0.6 uh, if there are only a few items or, or excuse me, um, like three items. Uh, you might accept as low as a 0.6. And that is in Joseph Hare's book as well. He talks about some uh, flexibility with small sets of measures. Okay. Um, I should say for, uh, oops, sorry. For social desirability, do we test them all together? No, we would test them separate. So to test this dimension of so social desirability, I would just do these first three measures to test the second dimension, I would only do these two measures. Um, and then the third of these four measures. Let's test that third one, because um, it looks dubious a little bit. Go down to social desirability, six through 10. And here it is, let's check this out. Notice the reliability statistic is less than 0.7. Um, it's only 0.6, is that okay? And in, in the case of this construct, yes, this is okay. Social desirability is a specific bias marker. Um, it's not a theoretically uh, critical variable to any theory right now, at least in this data set. It's just going to be used to test for method bias, um, specific bias uh, attributed to some method variable. And so is it OK that it's a lower uh, Cronbox alpha? Yes, that's OK. I mean, you don't want it to be a 0.2 or anything. That'd become useless. Um, but 0.6 is fine. OK, that is EFA. I have a question on the chat. Um, someone says, zoom, please. Oh, zoom in. Yes, done. Uh, someone else says, which is the most accepted method and rotation? Ah, in the factor analysis, uh, as shown, there are extraction methods here. Let me zoom in. Um, which one is most accepted? It really depends on your type of data and um, your area. In what I've done with business data, uh, we most often use PCA, a principal components analysis. Occasionally, we'll use PAF. Um, and maximum likelihood, but usually it's principal components analysis. Uh, a lot of behavioral psychological research uses generally squares. Um, but as Joseph Hare says, uh, it's just exploratory. So what I do more often than not is I'll actually use multiple extraction methods and see if my um, factoring solution is robust or resistant to uh, differing methods. If it is, then it's a pretty uh, strong uh, solution. Same with the rotation. Um, rotation, the default, I think I mentioned in M plus is direct Obumin, I believe. Um, in other softwares, it's, Ver it's Verimax. And then I choose Promax in uh, SPSS. Which one is the right one? Eh, depends on what you're doing. Uh, Verimax provides kind of a softer solution. So if you have what we call Haywood cases, uh, where you have a loading above one, uh, loadings should not be above one, 
Uh, if you have a Haywood case, Veramax will fix that. Um, if you want a clean solution, again, it's just exploratory. So you're just using that information to better understand your data. So getting a perfect solution isn't really uh, the goal of an EFA. But yeah, a lot of people use Veramax. I would say that's probably the most popular. I prefer Promax because it doesn't soften the loadings. It, it lets them be what they want to be, uh, be extreme if they want to be extreme. And so you get the truer loading, uh, if, if, if I can say it that way, if you use Promax. I almost never use direct oblumen unless I'm in M+. Plus. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Oh. Here's one more question. Uh, could you please reiterate the checks needed if factor loadings are low? Yeah, so if you end up with a low loading, let me go back over here to this pattern matrix. So zoom in here. Let's pretend for a moment that this line here, this is social desirability three. Let's pretend for a moment that it did not load anywhere above 0.3. So it was just blank all the way across. What do you do with that? Um, with the loading less than point. Uh, three, it, it's hard to do much, uh, but what I would first do before like deleting the item, because that's the last thing you want to do, uh, before deleting the item, I would change the extraction method. I would change over to principal axis factoring. In fact, let me do that right now. Oops, wrong one. Here's factor analysis. Instead of uh, principal components, let's shift over to principal axis factoring. See if that fixes it. Let's go back to that one loading there. And you see the loadings did change. In fact, this top one, whoa, that one changed a lot. Um, the loadings will change. The solution might not change. Like you see the, the pattern is still roughly the same. Um, ooh, did change that one. Look at that. Nice loading over here on the first factor. Um, so I would just explore other options. That one didn't work as well as I had hoped. Let me go check uh, maximum likelihood. Run that, jump down to the pattern matrix. Oh, look at that. Hey, that's kind of curious. All of the social desirability items loaded together. Now, some of them loaded negatively, and that's because as we saw the, in the items, the first half were positively coded, uh, meaning I am a good person, and the second half were negatively coded, meaning I'm a bad person. So of course, they're going to be inverse to each other. Um, if we were going to use them as a single factor, we'd want to re-reverse the values. Since these were on a five-point scale, we'd want to subtract those values from six, and then they would all load together. Um, so that's what you do. And if you couldn't resolve it, if you had an item that just wouldn't load with anything, or the loading was really low, um, you might try it in your CFA, and probably you'd find it still doesn't work. And if that's the case, you can omit that item. It's not contributing toward the measurement of that construct. You'd have to mention that in your write-up. Say, we omitted this item because it was a non-contributor that did not load uh, above a certain threshold, um, and it was bringing down the convergent validity of the, of the construct. So you just have to justify that. All right, uh, last thing was, please suggest a good book for EFA. Uh, Joseph Hare's book is really good. Let me just post that real quick. Um, I have it here. I'm just going to post it in the chat window. Here is the reference for Joseph Hare's book. Uh, he has a more recent edition, the eighth edition, I think is 2017. Um, it's a great book. Uh, I think most of what I learned from a book about SEM, I learned from this book. Uh, I've learned a lot from other instructors and from articles and uh, workshops and just from exploring and figuring things out um, and from videos on YouTube. Uh, but from a book, this is probably the most, uh, the, this book has probably contributed the most to my knowledge of any other uh, book on SEM. I even have it Ooh, right here next to my desk. And I reference it regularly. It, it is, you can't see in this room, my daughter's bedroom, which is my office now during the pandemic. Um, but this is the only book I have on my desk. Um, even at my office at my university, this is the only book I have on my desk. There are no books in my office except this book. I get no kickback, unfortunately. 
uh, from this. But uh, there's my glowing sponsorship for Joseph Hare's book. Okay. Uh, last question here. It says, for consumer behavior marketing perspective, would PCA or generalized one be better? I, again, uh, do both. Um, PCA is probably more common, um, but do both. It's just exploratory. So my, my philosophy is more transparency, more information about your data is better because you can make better decisions and you have more confidence in whatever you do observe. We're going to move forward. Uh, with Amos, uh, we've spent a lot of time here in SPSS on a thing that you might never have to do, but you need to understand it. Uh, it is sort of the foundation, it has foundational principles for the confirmatory factor analysis, which you should always do if you have latent factors. So let me show that to you. Um, over in Amos, where did I put Amos? Here's Amos. So Amos is a structural equation modeling software that allows you to model uh, measurement models and structural models simultaneously um, or separately, and also path models. And it is drag and drop. Uh, it, actually, it's click and click. There is no dragging and dropping. Um, it was built, I think, in the 90s, and it, the user interface has almost never been updated. So it is a pain in the rear to figure out for the first time, but once you figure it out or watch some of my videos, uh, you'll be able to use it. Um, and after you watch this, you'll be like, oh, that's kind of annoying and not intuitive, but it is literally the best software out there for covariance-based structural equation modeling um, for drag and drop. There are other softwares out there that do more rigorous, more precise, more comprehensive uh, SEM, uh, such as M plus Stata, uh, and there are several others. Um, but this one is a user <laughs> user friendly uh, in quote in air quotes uh, software. So the way you would draw a common uh, a confirmatory factor analysis is you would click on this candelabra thing, and then over here you'd draw this the ellipse that represents a latent factor of whatever size you'd like. Then you click on it a few times to add observed measures. So for example, for our solution over here, let me go back to a uh, this one. Uh, for our solution over here, anxiety has seven measures. I would need to click this seven times to get enough measures for anxiety. And then I'd want to uncheck that, double click this, call this anxiety. I'm not gonna do this for everything, but you'll see what I'm doing. Um, I go to the data set, which I haven't linked yet. You need to link your data set. To do that, you go to File, Data Files, find your data set. Mine's just in my Downloads folder. Let's see, you can see my directory structure there, nothing to hide there. Ooh, here it is right here. Okay. Okay. Uh, and here's the data set linked. I hit OK. And now I have a set of variables in this white stacky thing. I think that's supposed to represent a database or data set. Uh, and then I would have to drag out one at a time this item, which <laughs> defaults to massive label. I have to go fix that. View interface properties. I know you're not going to remember all this, uh, but that's why we're recording it. It's going to be in a saved video. Over in miscellaneous, don't display variable labels. That fixed that. And I'd have to do this for each item here. And it's kind of a pain in the rear. And Amos in general, uh, that's a good description for Amos in general. It's, it's a pain in the rear. Um, but it's better than what we have. And uh, let's see, resize. OK. And you'd have to do this for each of those factors that we had in our solution over here. Takes forever. So I created a plugin that will do this for you. Let me just erase everything here, um, erase all. Um, and let me show you the, how the plugin works. Uh, let me go to plugins and pattern matrix builder here. And all you have to do is paste your pattern matrix in here, which is way easier. I'm just going to copy this and paste it in here and then hit create diagram. And it will make it for you. This is what we would have had to make manually, which probably would have resulted in some human error um, and mistakes that we'd have to go and figure out later. 
Uh, and then the only thing you have to do here is uh, name it. So this is usefulness, et cetera. And we can name these things. I'm actually going to do this real quick because um, we will need uh, these names. Decision quality, anxiety. I already have a factor named anxiety in this data set. Uh, I need to change the name. Let me just call this anxiety underscore F for factor. Um, playful, let's see, playfulness. Uh, info acquisition, I'll just call this IA. CompUse, CU. Social desirability, SD. Uh, but I have three social desirabilities. So SDA. SDB and SDC. Um, I know this is small, uh, but so each, I can zoom in like this. There we go, let's just escape. I, um, if I scroll, I zoom in. So each latent factor is represented by an ellipse. Uh, this is common representation, common symbology in SEM. Uh, latent factors are ellipses, and observed measures are rectangles. Error. Um, is attributed to all predicted variables. And being predicted is indicated by an arrow going into you, becoming endogenous. So since all of these observed measures have arrows coming into them, they are being predicted by the latent factor, which is latent, hidden, not actually observed. Uh, but since they're being predicted, they need an error term associated with them, a unique one. So we've named each of these uniquely. And that, oh, and then the last thing, uh, and there are a couple more things. Each latent factor is correlated with every other latent factor. That is an assumption of covariance-based SEM, uh, at least for the measurement model. For the structural model, all exogenous variables, uh, variables that are not predicted, um, those are assumed to be correlated in covariance-based SEM. And so you would want to covary all exogenous variables, all the variables that are not being predicted. The last assumption here is that per latent factor, one parameter must be constrained. This provides some sort of an anchor for the algorithms to uh, minimize properly. Uh, there's some math behind it, but just trust me on this one. Uh, there must be one parameter constrained. Notice here uh, the parameter of this line right here is constrained to one. I can actually delete that and move it. It could be on this line instead, or this line. It doesn't matter. I could even put it out here um, on the latent factor as a variance constraint. There just needs to be at least one, but usually it's just one uh, parameter constraint per latent factor in a covariance-based SEM uh, application. Again, the reason behind that uh, is quite mathematical. I'm not going to cover that. And, uh, but just trust me, if, if your model doesn't run, it might be because of that. Okay. Let's run this and see what happens. First, I'm going to save. Just call this, uh, let's see, go over to downloads, call this uh, workshop CFA. And before I run it, I'm going to select a few options. I also need to show you where I got those plugins. Just a sec. Uh, so there is this abacus. Believe me, that is an abacus. It took me forever to figure out what that was. I thought it was a piano, but then that didn't make any sense. Anyway, it's an abacus with a little little color palette on it that opens up your analysis properties. So intuitive. Um, and in here, you can go to your output and select all the things you want to be outputted. We want standardized estimates for sure. Um, there are lots of other things. I'm actually just going to check one other thing that's modification indices. Some of you may have heard of modification indices in relation to the, the concept of model fit or goodness of fit. Modification indices tell you how to improve your goodness of fit. And they have a certain threshold for visibility. I'm just going to change this right now to uh, 20. And you may be asking, well, which is the right threshold? It's actually based on the chi-square, which is based on your um, degrees of freedom and sample size. So uh, it's relative. So if I had a basic model with a small sample size, four would probably be good. Uh, I have a fairly complex model with a larger sample size. So I chose a larger threshold because they will inflate based on that chi-square inflating. Okay. 
close that, zoom out, save one more time, and run this with the non-colored abacus. Oh, I'm so glad we run into this. This is great. OK, so check this out. Amos says, when I tried to run it, there's no valid license for Amos. I, I'm amazed they haven't fixed this yet. I do have a valid license. This is not like some pirated copy. I have paid for Amos. Um, and uh, this just happens. And I don't know why the programmers haven't fixed it. Uh, so when this happens, hit OK. You've saved your model, hopefully. I'm going to save it again, just in case. I'm going to close Amos completely, every instance of Amos. I only have one instance open, um, so I only have to close that one window of Amos. Um, if you weren't sure whether you had multiple instances, you just need to hover your uh, cursor over the Amos icon down here, and it would show you all the instances of Amos open. You could right click it and say close all, um, but I'm not going to because I only had that one open. Let me go ahead and open Amos again. It will open back up to that most recent model eventually. Here we go. And I will run it again. Hey, look, it ran this time. I do have a license. So weird. OK, so it ran. A bunch of numbers popped up. I'm going to select over here on the left. There's unstand. Oops. Like, ah, sorry. Over here on the left, there's unstandardized or standardized. I'm going to select standardized. Um, standardized is easier in a me measurement model because all of the loadings are relative to each other. Uh, not to each other. They're, 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 well, yes, more or less. They're in the same oh, spectrum. That's from negative one to positive one. Whereas unstandardized could be any value from negative infinity to positive infinity. So harder to, uh, to relate to each other. And we can just look at this. Um, we can sort of eyeball it. Zoom in here. Here's playfulness right here. And these are the loadings, sort of like the loadings we saw over here in the pattern matrix. Um, they will be different. They shouldn't be like strongly different, uh, absurdly different, but they will be different because uh, a CFA is guided. Um, we have specified which factor groups each measure should belong to. And so it is no longer uh, having to deal with that extra error. Um, it's, well, there's different error involved in constraining groupings rather than letting them be free. So the measures, uh, the loadings will be different, but only slightly, hopefully. Um, as you hover over them, they turn red. You can see what the loadings are. Again, we want above 0.7, ideally. Above 0.5 is fine, and even down to 0.3, 0.35 is probably OK, unless it completely undermines the validity of that measure, uh, of that construct. Um, and so we can look up and down here. We're looking pretty good. I don't see any like really low numbers. Um, these all look pretty good. Do -do -do. Oh, there's a 4, a 3. Th those aren't fabulous. Again, that's with social desirability, um, which is just a marker variable. So am I terribly concerned about the validity of that construct? Uh, not like strictly. I can be a little more liberal, uh, a little uh, less strict uh, when it comes to a marker variable like this. Uh, I don't want it to be completely invalid, but as long as we're having above 0.3s here, I'm, I'm not too worried. OK, but that's just eyeballing it. Let's actually do some work um, and, and check out the validity of these. I'm going to use another plugin for this. Uh, and I should show you where to get those plugins. So here's a plugin called, let's see, Validity and Reliability. And if I click on that, it checks my model and produces, we'll see here shortly, I hope. There it is. Uh, it produced a, an HTML file with a matrix in there, a correlation matrix with all correlations identified and uh, significance um, indicated with asterisks and the composite reliability, which is like the Cronbex alpha, but for a CFA. It's actually a different measure, uh, but it's and considered more valid than the Cronbex alpha, or at least more, uh, more uh, what's the word, specific, precise. 
the ABE, average variance extracted, uh, I should say CR is supposed to be above 0.7, just like a chromex alpha. Uh, ABE should be above 0.5. These are both, well, CR is a measure of reliability. ABE is a measure of convergent validity, although CR also achieves that. Um, maximum shared variance, uh, we can ignore that for now. Same with max R, we can ignore that for now. And then the square root of the AVE is on the diagonal and bolded. Let's talk about convergent and discriminant validity with this matrix. For convergent validity, we want the AVE above 0.5. Looks like we're doing pretty good. Uh, we have this one red in red, but that's for another reason. Um, it's because the MSV is greater than the AVE. Uh, we have these social desirability ones that are less than 0.5. So a little concerning, but again, marker variables, so not terribly concerned. We're really concerned with these ones up top here. The, the theory, um, the theoretical constructs that are part of our, our theory. Then, so convergent validity, we're pretty good. A discriminant validity would be looking at the square root of the ABE, which is on the diagonal in black, um, and comparing that to every other correlation. And we don't want this square root of the ABE to be less than any correlation with another factor, because what that implies is that the amount of variance explained by the set of items measuring that construct um, is actually, uh, the, the variance is actually better explained by some other construct. Uh, and so that would say that it's not a good set of measures and, and these two sets of measures are, are commingled and not distinct, not discriminant. So we look here and um, below here, we don't have anything above 0.837, below here and to the left, uh, nothing above uh, 0.749. We can do this for each one. We're looking pretty good with all of our critical constructs. We get down to the social desirability and it looks like um, we're still good. No, no real discriminant validity issues except this one identified here. Um, IA, uh, information acquisition, square root of the AVE, that's over here, 726. Uh, is less than 727. Ah, there is one. Okay. Um, that's really, really close. Um, and we could probably fix it if we did an EFA with just those two factors. Do I have time for that? Mm, maybe. Uh, what you could do is you could do an EFA like we did before in SPSS, but with just the items from those two factors. I'm not going to show you this, but it's just here. Uh, so information acquisition, decision quality, Remember when we tried to force this into seven factors, those actually collapsed onto a single factor. Uh, what we do is run a factor analysis with just those two uh, sets of items and see where they're overlapping, get rid of the overlaps, of the items that overlap, and then run the CFA again. Although at this point, it's so close. It's like, eh, do I really want to delete an item? Uh, you could justify it either way. That's up to you. And then see if your reviewers buy it. Okay. There are also measures of um, discriminant validity called the HTMT, the heterotrait monotrait ratio. And uh, you want all of these ratios to be less than 0.85 um, or 0.9 if you're being a little bit uh, loose about it. And it looks like we are. This indicates that we do have discriminant validity. Uh, here are some references for all that and some uh, notes. Now, the way you get these plugins, I have a video that shows how to install the plugins, but it's just over on the stat wiki. If you were to go to the left navigation bar, there's a plugins page. And on this plugins page, uh, explanations, a video of how to install them, uh, example of using them, explanations of what each one does. Uh, so there are lots of plugins. They're all free. Just use them. Um, if they don't work on your version of Amos, I apologize. I only have my specific versions of Amos that I've tested them on. Um, and I usually I make note if there is an issue with plugin uh, with compatibility. Okay. Uh, there was a question. Can we accept a factor with just three items? Ooh, good question. Yes, uh, let me go over here. So you'll see in uh, my model here, uh, that I have a factor with three items, I have a factor with two items. Are those okay? The answer is yes, they're okay. Uh, you can have a two factor, uh, sorry, a two item latent factor. That's fine. It's not great. It's not ideal, uh, but it's fine. 
if as long as they meet uh, the criteria for validity. Um, you can actually have slightly loose, uh, looser validity criteria for two item and three item measures uh, or factors uh, because they will have more error because there are fewer data points. Just like with sample size, the less, less the sample size, the more the error. Um, it's not ideal. Four is good. Uh, in fact, in that book, Joseph Hare's book, he says, if you had to pick an ideal number of items, it's four. Uh, it's enough to identify the construct and measure it validly, but it's not so much that you have multiple dimensions represented within those measures. Uh, so four is considered ideal by Joseph Hare. There are definitely arguments against that in other literature, uh, but I do subscribe to that to, to some extent. I am a, a Hareite, if that's a thing. Uh, I do follow <laughs> what he, he, he uh, has, has taught. Um, a hair disciple, maybe that's what I'm trying to say. Um, now, when you start getting measures with lots of items, you can see these ones here. A decision quality has uh, eight items. That's a lot. Um, and the problem with lots of items on a single reflective latent factor is you're, you're more likely to have multiple dimensions hiding within those, those several measures. And so um, uh, modeling them as a single factor is maybe imprecise and you'll lose some information. So going above eight would be, I, I don't know that I'd ever wanna do that, uh, going above eight measures per latent factor. And if I do, I'd want to test them in an EFA, totally exploratory uh, with a, just those items as a single factor uh, to see if they do break up into multiple, multiple dimensions. Okay, so that's a CFA. Oh, one more thing in a CFA. Um, one of the critical things you wanna test in a CFA is model fit. Model fit uh, is a comparison of the observed covariance matrix. That is to the, ex the extent to which all variables are related to all variables. Um, it's comparing that matrix to, uh, to the proposed matrix, which is implied by this model here. So we're suggesting that uh, the measures are correlated most strongly in these specific sets. Well, that produces a different correlation matrix. And when you subtract, it, it's a literal matrix subtraction problem. When you subtract the proposed covariance matrix from the observed natural covariance matrix, you get the chi-square. And the chi-square is a measure of the error associated with your proposed model compared to the observed model. And that is the extent to which your model fits the data, model fit. So how well, how good does your model fit the data? Uh, that is something we need to test because if there is a lot of error, i.e. high uh, chi-square, uh, then you have not modeled the relationships in this data set uh, very precisely, very, very correctly. Um, you have, there's some problems with the way it's been modeled, that those sets of measures don't belong together the way they've been modeled, uh, as indicated by poor fitting model to the data. The way you test that is by looking at the output here. Let me go to the output window. It is opening somewhere. All right, here it is. Nope, where'd you go, where'd you go? Right here, here's the output window. And if you were to go down to model fit, let me zoom in. Here are a bunch of measures of model fit. Uh, the C min is the chi-square, that, that's just another name for chi-square. Uh, the DF, the degrees of freedom. And uh, dividing those into each other, uh, you want something between uh, one and three is considered ideal, but it's an outdated measure. Very few people actually use that anymore. More people use measures like the CFI, the comparative fit index, which should be above 0.9, um, ideally above 0.95. It's just supposed to be approaching one. That's your target. Your target is one. Um, and so you want to approach that target. And above 0.9 is considered good. Uh, same with things like, let's see, the RMSEA, you want to be approaching zero. That is the target. Thing, uh, measures less than 0 0.05 would be uh, considered great. Less than 0.06 is acceptable. Less than 0.1 is also acceptable. 
just depends on who you read. Um, measures like the P-close uh, are related to the RMSEA. They give you a, a confidence uh, confidence in that measure. You actually want bad fit here. Uh, if you want the P close to be above 0.05 in this case. So this is actually good. It's a good fitting model. Uh, the last thing I often get questions about, oh, where'd it go? I often get questions about the chi-square P value. It's shown here. It's also shown, let me go back to notes for the model. Oops, uh, this one right here. It's shown in your notes for the model. Here's your chi-square, here's your degrees of freedom, and here's your p-value. And there's confusion around the p-value. Um, the rule is you want the chi-square test to be not significant. A significant, a significant chi-square test means that your proposed covariance matrix does not match the observed covariance matrix. Uh, they are different. P-test says they are different. Um, you want that to not be significant. You want them to be the same, more or less. You want, you want the difference between them to not be zero, or it could be zero, it could be significantly not different from zero. It's statistics, there are a lot of double negatives. In this case, you want the p-value above 0.05, uh, but it is a very strict measure of model fit and considered outdated because it's very sensitive to model complexity and uh, sample size because it's dependent upon the chi-square, which inflates with sample size and, and model complexity. So very few people use that anymore. You can report it, but I would not, I would not throw out your model because you didn't have a bad p-value here, a bad meaning above 0.05, which is good. <laughs> Again, model fit, there are a lot of double negatives. You want this above 0.05 to indicate that you have good fit. Um, but I never use it. I use CFI, RMSEA, and I use another one, the SRMR. Let me show you that. The SRMR doesn't actually compute in Amos. Uh, they wrote a plugin for it and never bothered to integrate it into the main uh, output. So to run this standardized RMR, pick that plugin, and then don't hit close, hit run. And then it'll pop up here and it'll say your SRMR is 0.0480. We want something less than 0 0.08, so that's good. So, whoops, um, we have a lot of indication that we have a good fit, uh, a good fitting model. Not all of the model fit metrics were like hunky dory, good uh, above and below the right thresholds, um, but you don't need optimal fit, you need adequate fit. One way to summarize all this is you go to plugins, model fit measures, that's just one of the plugins. Uh, that I have in my data set uh, or in, on, on the stat wiki. Let's see, it's going to pop up here. Here we go. And it says, here are the estimates we observed. Here are the ideal thresholds and some interpretation. Is it good fit? Uh, and the citations for that. So that's model fit. We're running out of time. Let's move over to structural models real quick. So you can have a, as, as mentioned before, you can have a latent structural model, which gets really complicated really fast. And I'll show you that. Or you can have a path model with uh, imputed factor scores. I'll show you that as well. So if you want to run a latent model, which is considered more rigorous, by the way, more valid, it, it, it um, accounts for measurement error better than a path model, which uses just uh, factor scores. Um, so it is better to run a latent model when you can, but it is highly complex. Um, and so if you have low sample size or if you're running interactions, uh, it is usually infeasible to run a fully latent structural model. And instead, you would do a path model. But I'm going to show, show it to you here uh, for your sake here. I'm going to make a dependent variable of decision quality. Oops. Uh, let me use this symmetry option. And then the moving truck, the fire truck, to move things around. There we go. That's weird. Um, and then I'm going to rotate these items so they're not in the way. I'm going to delete the covariance arrows because we're about to predict this latent factor. You can't both covary and predict. And draw arrows 
from usefulness to decision quality. These are single-headed regression arrows. Um, let's pretend we have a uh, mediator for a moment. Let me move information acquisition over to this position and we'll treat it like a mediator. Delete its covariance arrows uh, because we want to we want to predict it. And let's draw some arrows from uh, these variables to that and from information acquisition to decision quality. It's now a mediator. And let's throw these in here as well. And you, you don't want a floating variable, a variable that's not predicting anything or being predicted by anything. Um, that would be weird and useless. Okay, just going to organize this a little bit better like this. Really should have saved this before making all these changes. Oh, well, there we go. So this is my latent causal model. It's a bit of a mess. Uh, it's very complex um, and it's incomplete. I actually need to provide error on anything predicted. So that needs an error term. That needs an error term. And we need to name those errors. And I know I'm going way too fast, um, but it's all being recorded. So there you have it. So we've named those errors. We've gotten everything right, I think. I'm going to run this. Hey, it ran, look at that. And standardized estimates are being displayed. And if we look into this a little bit more closely, let me go over here, we can see that information acquisition has a strong positive effect on decision quality. Um, that regression weight is 0.63, probably statistically significant. Don't know by looking at the model. Uh, unfortunately, Amos does not provide significance indications on the model, but you can see it over here in the output. Here in estimates, you can see the p-values for all those regressions. Um, so for example, the one we were looking at was information acquisition to um, decision quality. That's this one right here. And it has a p-value of three stars. That means less than 0 0.001. We can actually change the decimals here to whatever we want. Here they are, and it's still less than 0 0.010 zeros one. Um, so it's a very small p-value. Let me change that back. That was kind of obnoxious. There we go. Okay. Um, that's a latent causal model. Very few people uh, do this in Amos because again, it's very complex. They prefer a path model. You can create a path model by uh, imputing factor scores. I already have factor scores imputed, but I'm gonna show you how to do this. I'm gonna go back to this model. Let me see if I can just go back to it without saving. This one, no, don't save. There we go, back to this model. Um, I would go to analyze data imputation, and that is going to compute a factor score, which is a weighted by regression weight, weighted average that is standardized so that, um, so that each factor like usefulness up here, instead of being measured by uh, seven different observed items is measured now by one factor score that accounts for all of those weights. Um, so I can just impute, I actually have a file name that I need to change the file name. Um, Two, there we go. Um, if I hit impute, it will impute those. It says that data set was created. I can close this, create a new canvas here, upload the new data, which is just in the same directory as my old data, which was downloads. You can see this is the one we just created, and it will have some new variables at the very bottom, which I'll show you. At the very bottom here, zoom in it has these new ones um, that we just created starting with sdc so i could create a path model from just these let me do that okay i think we had decision quality out to the right 
and information acquisition right here in the middle, and pretty much everything else uh, on the left. Now I'm not going to bring out social desirability for now because it's just going to make things more complicated. Um, we'll just create this kind of basic path model. And if I want to make it pretty, I can resize observed variables. They're all the same now. Draw my regression weights or my regression lines. Just like before, but a lot less mess. Draw my error terms. Name my error terms. Covary my exogenous variables. And then just make it look good. Well, it doesn't look very good. Oh, well, it's, it's pretty close. Um, and now I can run this model. I'm going to add one more parameter um, to, to my output. That's going to be squared multiple correlations. That's the R square. Um, we can also do mediation right now, but let's just test this real quick. Save this as workshop path. Run it. I know I'm going fast. It's because we're running out of time. After I run this, you can see here are the regression weights. We can see that usefulness has a strong effect on information acquisition. Information acquisition has a strong effect on decision quality. And the R square for decision quality is pretty high, 62, um, which you can see up here in the top right. Notice that this value, this regression weight, 0.79, is different from what we observed in the latent causal model, um, a latent structural model. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is we aren't including all of the same constructs here. We actually dropped all three social desirability constructs. And they may have been explaining some variance in decision quality um, that, I, that, that now information acquisition is explaining. So it's absorbed some of that and inflated a bit. Um, the other reason is because we are not uh, accounting for all the measurement error, because this is just a path model. And so these values will change slightly. Uh, they shouldn't change drastically, but they will change slightly. So which one's more valid? The latent model, because it is accounting for all that error. Um, which one's easier to use? The path model. Which one is most commonly used uh, in AMOS path modeling, in M plus and other uh, syntax-based softwares? Uh, usually the latent model because the complexity is hidden in the code. Uh, you don't have to worry about it visually as much. All right, we're super running out of time. We have like 13 minutes. Um, there are ways to do mediation and moderation. Um, I'm going to cover those crazy fast and not complete. To do moderation, you would double click on group number over here and you'd add a new group, group number two. And to each of these groups, you would add their own data set right here. And then you'd run the model with both data sets. And then you could toggle back and forth between um, the, let's say it's male versus female or something like that. You could toggle the male data set and the female data set. It can actually be the same data set as long as you uh, provide evidence of a grouping variable right here and provide a grouping value to say uh, in my gender column, uh, one is male, two is female, or something like that. And then it would just run the analysis for the ones in one group and for the twos in another group. And then you could compare those. Uh, there's more sophisticated methods there that you could do. Don't have time for that, but I have videos for that. And the course covers that if you want to try the course. Remediation, um, I have lots of plugins for that. Uh, but the basics are, without the plugins, you go to analysis properties, do indirect, direct, and total effects, and run a bootstrap. Mediation requires a bootstrap because you're, produ you're producing confidence intervals. Um, so here's the bootstrap. Run it a lot of times, usually upwards of 500. Uh, 2,000 is a pretty good number. You could do some bias correction because there is some inflation going on. You can also change the confidence level from 90 to 95 if you want. I prefer 90 because it's mediation. And mediation is already got some issues in it. Oops, I need to get rid of this group. Delete. If we run this, uh, we can see in the output that there are now, where'd you go? Estimates, matrices. Let me zoom in here. 
you'll see on the left, we have uh, total effects, uh, direct and indirect effects. I'm gonna go to the standardized indirect effects. And we can see over on the right, oops, sorry, too big. Um, let me pull this over here. There we go. We can see that uh, the indirect effect from usefulness to decision quality has this re standardized regression weight. And if we want to see the p-value for that, we can come down here and look at bootstrap confidence, bias corrected percentiles, two-tailed significance, and the p-value for that indirect effect is 0 0.001. So we have a significant indirect, i.e. mediated effect between usefulness and decision quality. And I know that was a whirlwind. Again, it's all recorded. There are videos for all of it. It's all on the stat wiki. It's all in the online course. Uh, this was just a uh, really quick exposure to the kinds of analyses you can do with SPSS and Amos. And there's so much more. Usually I cover this <coughs> in multiple semesters of, of courses. So I missed a lot. I didn't cover everything. Didn't talk about method bias, invariance testing, interactions, uh, hierarchical models, uh, higher order models. Uh, there, there's a lot we didn't cover. In the few minutes we have left, are there any questions re regarding this or anything related to this? anyone has to ask anything, he or she can ask directly. Uh, let's see, Mohina, you raised your hand. Go for it. It was a nice session and very quick. We'll refer to the video later. Yeah. But thank you very much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. Professor, I wanted to ask, can we perform multi-level modeling in SPSS? Um, yeah, by multi-level modeling, I assume you mean uh, something like organization, department, employee. Yes, 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 yes. Um, the answer is yes, I think it's possible. I've never done it. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, I have no videos on it, and I'm definitely not an expert in that area. Um, I'd look for other YouTube creators to, to help with that. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Somebody else asked, let's see, Sonal asked, for common method bias, how to select the variables. Oh, yeah. So there are multiple ways to do method bias. Um, I can just show you on the stat wiki real quick. I think I have some pictures. Um, CFA and method bias. So there are different approaches to method bias. <clears throat> um, there's the uh, common latent factor where you relate some unmeasured latent factor to all existing measures. Um, there's another one where you have some marker like specific, uh, like uh, social desirability, um, and you include that as a latent factor. And then again, a an unmeasured latent factor over here, connecting all of them together. Uh, that's another way and considered more rigorous. Um, and it doesn't have to be social desirability, some specific bias variable. It could just be some theoretically unrelated variable, uh, some variable that shouldn't be related to the other factors. Um, but uh, the extent to which it is related can then be extracted out by that common factor. It's not perfect because if there is some trait variance that is shared, uh, that is also extracted. Um, so it's definitely not perfect, but it's better than just using a common factor alone. Because what, what, what the common factor does is it doesn't extract method variance. It extracts common variance, which might be trait variance, uh, which is what you're trying to use to explain your theory. Uh, so using just a common factor is actually not a great solution. Um, having the marker variable in there helps because it minimizes uh, the amount of variance being extracted. Um, and the most current approaches uh, I explain here in detail, the best approach is if you have a specific bias uh, marker. So if you're collecting data, for example, on uh, good and bad behavior. Social desirability is a really good marker variable for that because there is some socially desirable way to answer those questions um, about bribery and, and uh, theft and, and things like that. The people are all, they're all gonna say, no, I don't do that. No, I don't do that. Um, 
So there's a socially desirable way to answer those questions. In that case, social desirability is a good marker variable. In other cases, um, such as uh, company allegiance or loyalty, um, when you're asking company questions like how innovative is your company? How successful is your company? Uh, how much do you like your company? All of these things uh, will be inflated for very loyal employees and for disloyal employees or empo employees who are, um, who are uh, feel disenfranchised or feel um, un unloved by their organization or feel like leaving, uh, these will all be deflated. They won't, they won't match the, the true, quote unquote, true measure of, of the construct. And so you might pick a specific bias variable like loyalty um, to, to extract that. Oh, thank you, Professor, for the answer. Uh, yeah. Just one thing also I wanted to ask, do they actually ask for the justification of why we chose, for example, social desirability as the method by factor or uh, no justific justification has to be given? Um, if it's not evident, it should definitely be explained uh, for sure. Good reviewers will probably identify that, uh, but not all reviewers are good reviewers, so they might not. Um, but in all cases, it's good to justify your analytical decisions. Uh, whenever I read through a paper as, a, as an editor or reviewer, I check the, the decisions they made, the analytical decisions they made that could have changed their results. And if there are decisions they made that aren't justified, even if I think I know why they did what they did, um, I ask them to please give me at least parenthetical justification uh, for why they made that decision and what the consequence would be. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, but we can use a new kind of variable, not necessarily which is available, like in established scales, validated scales we use. For common method also, are there any validated kind of, uh, or we can use any? Yeah, so the most common um, method bias variable is definitely social desirability bias. Uh, that is actually the only marker variable that I'm aware of that has been validated to, to uh, somewhat effectively extract method variance. Um, most others that have been tried, they share too much trait variance. Like I mentioned loyalty. Loyalty shares too much trait variance with other constructs. And so it's hard to use that and not break your model. Um, method bias is a tricky thing. Uh, accounting for it, try, trying to mitigate it, excuse me, uh, methodologically in your model often destroys the validity of your factors. Um, and so it hurts your model. So instead, it may be better just to show that there is not significant bias um, and then move on without trying to mitigate any nominal bias. But that's a debated topic, and I'm definitely just one voice in, in that, uh, that debate. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I've got to run here. Um, I have to run off to another meeting. So thank you for your participation. But just for a quick memory, we can have a snapshot, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, all of you, have, if you can switch on your videos, we can. Oh, you want everybody to turn on their video? Yeah, that can we can have. Oh, sure. I'm going to stop recording though.